Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome to our webinar today. We're really excited to be giving this uh, today about engineering ethics and liability. Uh, I am Jason Allen, the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association Director, and with me is Heather Christensen from Geneva Pipe and Precast. How are you doing, Heather? Good. How are you doing, Jason? Thanks for having me. Doing very well. Thank you for uh, for deciding to tag team this with me and and to help me teach these fine people about ethics. We've got a, a couple of housekeeping items just so that you can uh, uh, be aware of. This will be recorded. We will be putting this on our uh, YouTube page, which is just Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association is our YouTube page. So we will be putting that on our uh, on this when it's done. Uh, we will have some poll questions during this presentation. We also have uh, a handout that you can download. And so we'll we'll talk about that handout when we get there. Uh, but when we do the poll questions, I've I've heard some reports that on some some viewers and some browsers that when you have the presentation in full screen mode, it doesn't allow you to vote. So when we get to the to poll uh, the polling questions, just keep that in mind and remember that if you if you want to vote, you may have to go out of full screen mode to vote. So just keep those in mind there. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started by introducing ourselves. As I mentioned before, my name is Jason. I'm the director of Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. I graduated from the University of Utah with bachelor's and master's degrees in water resources engineering. And I have 18 years of experience in the engineering field. Started out surveying and uh, worked in the land development sector, which I'll be talking about a little bit today as we talk about ethics and things, uh, doing work for developers. I also worked in the public sector as the Morgan County engineer. And then I got back into consulting. Uh, I, I started my own business. I, I have my own little business on, on doing some things and I do uh, marketing engineering now for the Concrete Pipe Association. Awesome. Okay, so my name is Heather. As Jason mentioned, I am also a graduate from the University of Utah's Civil Engineering Program. I graduated uh, two years back about May 2018. I have five years experience in the engineering field, but a couple of those years were while I was going through college. I worked about a year and a half doing some research in an environmental engineering lab at BU, and then I've also done a couple different internships in local consulting firms in the greater Salt Lake City area. And now, for the last two years actually, my work anniversary was July 2nd, I've been working at Geneva Pipe and Precast as their technical marketing manager and also a member of their engineering department. So, well, so as I mentioned before, we are uh, here representing the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. And the Concrete Pipe Association, uh, what, what the, the association does is we are a technical resource uh, for engineers in the area when it comes to uh, concrete and uh, precast concrete products and pipe and, and different things. We do a lot of training and, and webinars. And uh, when, when things get back to normal, we're hoping to get it back into uh, folks' offices and help doing lunch and learns and, and uh, presenting at conferences and different things. Uh, but we do want to recognize our member companies. We have a few member companies that, that are part of our association, and we want to recognize them at this point. As I mentioned, we have uh, uh, Heather from Geneva Pipe and Precast uh, that, that will be helping with this presentation today. And we also have Old Castle Infrastructure is another one of our member companies. Uh, I believe Randy Wallen from Old Castle Infrastructure. I think he's uh, on, on the line with us. He was on, on earlier. I don't know if he's uh, still on. But uh, anyways, Rand, are you there, Randy? Can I say hi, Jason? I, I will allow it. I mean, this is this is the Heather and Jason show, but I think I think we will uh, take a moment and let Randy uh, steal the spotlight for a few seconds here. How are I, you? Randy? I just want I just want to say that I'm offended that I wasn't asked to participate in an ethics seminar. I feel like that's one of my strong points. Do you now? <laughs> um, yes, I've I've always I've always thought that I was strong at at getting around, th oh, no, I mean, uh, at telling the truth. Yes, so, yes. Andy, it, it, don't worry, you'll be the star of the show as soon as you've got another Box Colbert presentation. <laughs> oh, thanks, Heather. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> in in retrospect, I wonder if it would have been a better idea to ask Randy to to uh, to do this this presentation so that he could research and actually learn what ethics were. I think sometimes we, you know, when you're asked to give a lesson or something, uh, it, it's it's for your benefit more than anyone else. So maybe 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 in hindsight we should have asked Randy to do this one. Who knows? Um, I just want everyone to know that I'm six feet tall too. I think yes. I, I think I think it's ethical to say that. 
I think that's very ethical to say that and put that on your uh, on your on your profiles. Yes. Uh, we also do want to recognize, in addition to Geneva Pipe and Precast and Old, Cap Old Castle Infrastructure, uh, our manufacturing companies that, that manufacture the pipe and precast products. We do also want to recognize Ashgrove and Wholesome, who are our cement suppliers. They they provide a lot of uh, resources to us in the association and in the industry, and, and they've been really good to help us in this association to to uh, move things to the next level over the last few years. So we want to thank them as well. Uh, as we get going in this presentation, I do want to point out that if you have any questions or any comments, feel free to add those in the question box there uh, in the webinar platform here. Um, Travis has already commented that he says, Randy, you are definitely six feet tall. So I guess that would make Travis Jockinson about seven and a half or eight feet tall. So uh, thanks, Travis, <laughs> for the comment. Uh, the takeaways today uh, that we'll be talking about, we're first going to discuss ethics and what they are and how they relate to our industry. In order to illustrate that, we're going to be giving some, some case studies and discussing some things that are in our industry code. So we will be discussing that a little bit and, and going over some of the, some of the different canons and, and things that, that we should be keeping in mind when we're, when we're working to make sure that we are uh, being ethical in our, in our industry. And then lastly, we are going to talk a little bit about liability and what that means uh, with the role of the engineer and how we can hopefully be smart about what we're doing and limit that liability. So we'll, uh, I'm going to turn the time over to Heather to, to talk about ethics now. Great. Thank you, Jason. Okay, ethics. So what is ethics? Um, I like to think of the word ethics as what is right and what is wrong or what's good versus what's bad. But the trouble with ethics is really it's not always black and white like this picture is. Um, there's probably quite a bit of gray areas in there. Um, ethics might differ from person to person, from family to family, or from country to country, right? Um, what we think is ethical here might not be the same ethical principles that a different country has. And even, even era to era, so like time frame wise, uh, think about maybe 100 or 200 years back. Think about the ethical principles that they've got and what we've got today and how those might differ. I, I would be the first to say that they're probably not the same, right? Like slavery was okay. Um, women in the workplace is not okay. So maybe back then, me giving a presentation to a group like this probably would have been considered unethical. But now think about how that social or legal ethics might work when your grandchildren's grandchildren become your age. So there's really a lot of gray areas, areas in ethics, and it's not always black and white, but let's dig a little bit farther into the definition and see what that tells us. So Merriam Webmaster Dictionary defines the definition of ethics is the discipline dealing with what is good and bad. Okay, that's what we already kind of talked about. And what moral duty and obligation. It's a set of moral principles, a theory or system of moral values the principles of conduct governing an individual or a group, a guiding philosophy, a consciousness of moral importance. Okay, so this kind of helps, right? Now, what I really want you to focus on is the underlying areas. So the principles of conduct governing an individual or group. So in this presentation, we're specifically talking about engineers as a group. And lucky as engineers, even though there, there could be a lot of gray areas for social ethics and what might be wrong from person to person, perception wise, we're lucky as engineers because we have industry codes. We have a kind of rule book or a, a tool source that we can use to help us understand and, and kind of eliminate some of those gray areas. And that's what we're really going to be talking about today is, is the ethics that govern engineering profession. Perfect. You know, we thought it would be fun to share before we get too far into dealing with ethics. We thought it'd be fun to share this, this Gallup uh, public opinion poll that was done uh, in December of 2019. And what this was, was this was um, people were asked to rate different professions based on the honesty and ethical standards of the people in those fields. And, and they were asked to say very high, high, average, low, or very low. And so these were all ranked based on those that got the highest marks were put at the top of the list. And those that got the lowest marks of honesty and ethical standards were put in the lower part. So Interestingly enough, a few years ago, the same poll was done, and I saw it then. And uh, engineers now, as of 2019, have moved up into second place. They they actually jumped medical doctors, who were the uh, second most trusted profession. So right now, the most trusted profession are nurses, and uh, and the second are engineers. 
And I, I want to point out that as you move down this list a little bit with, you know, college teachers, psychiatrists, down here is clergy. So we're uh, engineers are, are, are apparently in the public's mind uh, more honest and ethical than the clergy. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I wanted to show the, the last half of this list as well. As you move down uh, under clergy, you've got journalists. And as you move down, you've got uh, lawyers, which I think is interesting that they uh, went as high as they did. Anyways, um, we won't get into that. But go down here at the very bottom here, you notice members of Congress. You gotta love that, that the uh, members of Congress, the only profession that ranked lower than members of Congress were uh, car salesmen. So just thought that would be a. Uh, interesting to point that out that that we have that opinion and that that public view of engineers and our our uh, honesty and ethical standards are very high so we want to make sure we don't betray that so let's let's jump into a little scenario here heather and we'll we'll launch a poll here and, and let people vote on this one so i'm going to lay this situation out all right and then we'll and then we'll we'll do a poll so uh we're going to say that an engineer works for a firm and this engineer the, the firm pays for this engineer to go to a conference, okay? They go to a trade show, and the, 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 the firm is paying for all of their expenses, uh, travel, room, board, food, everything, okay? The, the, the fee to enter the conference, everything is paid for by the firm. So this engineer now wins a door prize worth $5,000, okay? The question is, is it ethical to keep the door prize, or should, should this engineer remit it to the employer. So I'm going to launch a poll here and I'm going to let you all vote. Okay, it's not launching here for me. I apologize. Hold on. Uh oh. Heather, are you seeing that? Is it launching? Nope, I'm not seeing anything on my end. Run real fast here. Let me see what I can do here. Okay. Oh, I launched it. Oh, there you go. There you go. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, so um, Jason just kind of described the story. So what should the engineer do? He just got this $5,000 pro door prize. Um, his, his employer paid for all the expenses. Should he A, keep that prize, B, remit the prize to the employer, or C, run away to Albania and live like royalty? So what do you guys think? You should be able to select and then we'll go over those results afterwards. Okay, finally, someone someone's with me to run away to Albania. Let's go. The average household <laughs> income the average household income in Albania is $70 a month. So uh we could we could live like like royalty for 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 many months with $5,000. Tell me when you want me to close the poll. All right. Yeah, let's uh I think everybody's about voted now, so go ahead and close it, and uh, let's share okay. the results here. Does it show? If we share, if you click oh, there, there you go. So, if you want to go ahead and share those, Heather? Yeah, so, okay, so what you guys just said is um, a portion of you, 47% half almost, say he should keep that prize. 50% uh, says remit prize to the employer, and 3% says run away to Albania. Okay, well, Jason, you want to kind of talk about that result? What Absolutely. do you think is right? So the engineer actually has an ethical obligation to report the price because the employer paid for everything there. There is an ethical obligation to report the price. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the uh, company would keep the price, but the ultimate decision is made between the engineer and the employer on, on who gets to keep it. But there is an ethical obligation to report that. So... Uh, that's just a, a fun little fun little case study and pull there. Yeah, that would be one of those little gray areas where you know you're not really sure whether it's ethical or unethical. And usually, if you're not sure, probably bring it up to someone. Sure, communication is a good key in in ethics. When you want to, you know, if you have any questions or it, it feels it doesn't quite feel right, I, I suggest that you you definitely communicate and discuss that. So uh, we're gonna transition now and talk about the National Society of Professional Engineers. This is the NSPE, and the NSPE has, has come out with what they call an engineer's creed. Now I have made that available, as I mentioned, as a handout to download uh, so that you can you can go over and, and take a look at, at what this creed is, but I, I wanted to read it to you because I, I just really find it 
uh, really intriguing and, and fascinating. But you can have you can have this. I've got a PDF that you can download, print out, and, and keep keep close to you so that you can read it off and and, and remember to keep those those uh, high ethical standards as an engineer. As part of the engineer's creed, they've got a preamble, some fundamental canons, rules of practice, and professional obligations. But I wanted to read just the the short text of the creed to you right now. It says, as a professional engineer. I dedicate my professional knowledge and skill to the advancement and betterment of human welfare. I pledge to give the utmost of performance, to participate in none but honest enterprise, to live and work according to the laws of man and the highest standards of professional conduct, to place service before profit, the honor and standing of the profession before personal advantage, and the public welfare above all other considerations. In humility, and with need for divine guidance, I make this pledge. So that was adopted back in 1954. And I just, I, I love the words of that and how it talks about, you know, the betterment of human welfare and, and putting, you know, the honor and standing of the profession before ourselves and, and the public welfare above all of the considerations. I just, I, I just really love that, uh, that creed. So I hope you all enjoy it and, and download it and read it often so that you can uh, be inspired by it as well. Um, a couple of other points that I was really, impressed by as I was studying for this is the in the preamble a couple of a couple of points that I wanted to make uh, in the preamble it talks about one exhibiting the highest standards of honesty and integrity two engineering has a direct and vital impact on the quality of life which I think a lot of us forget I was uh, talking with Heather about this yesterday and um, we were talking about essential essential work and and businesses and public safety and and a member of a public works department told me a few months ago when we were talking about essential services and essential employees he said I think a lot of times we forget and and many people forget that you know when we're talking about public safety and and we're thinking about law enforcement or EMTs or first responders firefighters you know things like that they they forget that that public works directors and engineers we are in the public safety realm it is our job to make sure that that things are safe for for people and that we can have you know improve their quality of life you know safe travel safe drinking water safe uh, safety from flooding or or structural damage during a during a catastrophe so these are things that that a lot of times we don't i don't think we even look at ourselves as being in the in the public safety realm but we are uh, Engineering services require honesty, impartiality, fairness, equality, and must be dedicated to public health, safety, and welfare. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. So, okay, so ASCE, I remember I told you there's um, there's industry code that we can, we can really rely on and utilize to understand what's ethics and, and how that impacts our careers. So ASCE has a code of ethics. They adopted it back in 1914. Um, the most recent update was in 2017. And I'm sure you guys have all heard of it. It's got eight canons. Actually, the eighth canon was implemented in 2017. It didn't exist before then. But we're going to go into each of those into depth. So the first canon is to hold safety paramount. So as an engineer, you're responsible for the safety of your design. Um, the public relies on us, OK? Canon number two is to service with competence. Don't be out designing on a project that you don't know, you don't have that knowledge set. Make sure that you're only stamping and, and um, participating in plans that you know what you're doing. Canon three is to issue true statements. Make sure that whenever you're addressing the public that you are addressing them with facts and you're, you're um, being honest and you're doing that proper. Um, don't have any bias opinion there. Make sure you're using your engineering judgment and you're, you, you're talking about areas of your competence. Canon four is to act as a faithful agent. So this deals with how you're servicing your clients, um, how you're servicing your employer. Make sure that you're faithful to both of those people. Uh, those, that's really important. You put others' needs before yourselves. Canon five, reputation by merit. So essentially this one's talking about Build your reputation based off of your services and your your qualifications. Do not bribe. Do not do not make unfair measures to build your reputation. Canon six is uphold professional honor. So this one's really funny. Um, notice that in the Gallup opinion, uh, engineers are they have a pretty high reputation amongst society, right? So if a engineer does something sketchy. How does that impact the reputation that public has for our engineering community? So it's important that all engineers uphold that professional honor. 
Canon 7 is to continue professional development. So this is making sure that you're always staying up to date on changing codes, on change and like ethics, right? They just developed Canon 8 in 2018. And Canon 8 is to treat all persons fairly. So maybe if you weren't staying up to date and continuing your professional development, you might not have known that it's important to treat people fairly. I'm, I'm hoping you would have. But maybe you wouldn't have. So in this presentation, we're going to go into a deeper look into each of these canons and really think about what they mean to us as engineers. So let's start with canon number one. Canon number one is hold safety paramount. So what does this mean? We need to, in our designs, put the safety and the health and the welfare of the public. This is canon number one for a reason. When you're when you're choosing your designs, you need to make sure you're selecting sustainable development options. Um, this is one of the bullet points for this, this canon. You want to make sure you're protecting not only current generations, but future generations as well. Um, do not, if you, have a, if you have a safety concern about your project, you need to make sure you're informing your client or your employer about that. Don't hold it in. Uh, make sure that you're talking about safety concerns. And improve the environment and quality of life of the general public in all your designs. That's always going to be canon number one. Make sure you're putting that first. So let's go over a case study. Uh, this case study shows just how important it is to put safety first in every design. So if you don't recognize this picture, this is an engineering failure. So this is I-35W bridge in Minnesota. Minnesota. This happened in 2007. So this bridge was built in 1967 and on August 1st, 2007 at 6.01 p.m. the bridge collapsed. 13 people died and 145 people were injured in this engineering failure. So I'm going to quick play just an audio of a video I found on YouTube about this. So let me turn up my volume, make sure you guys can hear it. Okay. She was on the phone with her and she said that the, uh, that the bridge was collapsed that she was on and she had to go and we can't get a hold of her anymore and we're just trying to find out if she's okay or, or what's going on but we're pretty sure she was on the bridge when it was collapsing. There's a group of kids that were uh, pulled off and they were crying and we came down they were just getting pulled out and find out is the person that I care about all right, I mean, are they hurt? Are they? I'd be happy just to know she's hurt right now because that way I know she's alive. And how did this happen? Was it because the bridge was too old? The bridge was 50 years old when it collapsed, and, and at that time, one in five bridges were older than the bridge. So 20% of bridges were older than this bridge's age that collapsed. So it wasn't the age, it had nothing to do with the age. There were a number of reasons why this ended up happening. Um, a couple of them were improper design. So they did an investigation. They found out some design issues in the bridge. There was overloading during the time of collapse. Uh, there was some construction going on where they, they stored some construction materials and it overloaded the bridge. And there was poor communication between all the parties involved. And so I would say, in my opinion, after looking into this project, those were the main things that went wrong here. But let's just quick talk about the story. So this particular bridge was investigated. It kind of, they had a fatigue analysis, a firm that was hired on to come in and perform a fatigue analysis. And they categorized this bridge as structurally deficient, meaning that bridge needed repair. And this bridge was actually categorized as structurally deficient for 15 years. Now they didn't repair the bridge because it was stable. It was, it wasn't the changes there, the conditions weren't changing, but the gusset plates, which basically a gusset plate, if you're unaware, basically it's a big sheet of metal that's used to transfer the load from member to member and it's put right on the joints. And if you understand bridge designs, you understand that the joints are critical. Um, so that gusset plates, those, all of the gusset plates were designed, um, about under designed by a factor of two. I think that they said that they're about a half inch thick when they should have been an inch thick. So one particular gusset plate when they did the fatigue analysis and it was near the center of the root bridge, it was reported to have signs of bending. And so what does that tell you? When steel starts bending, it's giving you a warning, right? Um, when concrete starts cracking, you can have you can consider that as a warning. We understand the mechanisms of failure of different materials. And during the time of collapse, the bridge was also undergoing some type of construction where they added some construction loads. 
on the deck nearby that gusset plate that was actually starting to bend. And to be exact, the construction loads that were added, I have it written down here, which blows my mind. So what they were storing on the bridge ended up being 580,000 pounds of material. So if you equate that to your average car, maybe a Toyota Corolla that may weigh 2,000 pounds, you would have 290 Toyota Corollas. And that, that construction material was stored on an area of about 12 by 115 feet. So if you put Toyota Corollas in that area, you could probably fit about seven of them on that area, but then you have to start stacking them. And if you were going to stack that many Toyota Corollas, you'd have to stack them 40 feet, 40 rows high. So that is four times the design load that that bridge was ready for or able to hold. So the issues here, absolutely a design error, absolutely overloading, poor communication between all parties involved, but who ended up paying for this? Obviously, it was the people who suffered the collapse, the people who lost their life, the people who became injured. Um, in terms of monetary value, engineers were liable. Uh, the, the design firm that originally did the design, who did the, um, the improper gusset design, they paid about $9 million. The fatigue analysis firm paid about $52 million. But this is a prime example as to why it's so important to put safety first over everything as you're designing. Okay. Well, the second canon is to perform services only in the areas of your competence. And so this, this basically means that you're only going to undertake assignments when you're qualified by either education or some type of experience that you've had in that, in that uh, field. So uh, it also includes not affixing your signature to plans or documents where you lack competence or expertise in that area. Now, the, the question comes up about, well, what if I'm the project manager and I need to stamp the whole project set? Um, that's okay. You can, see, you can sign and seal uh, the entire project as long as you have technical engineers sign, signing their segments. I know I've done, done projects before where I've had uh, a structural engineer sign maybe uh, the structural portion with the bridge or the box cover or whatever, and then I signed as the project manager the whole plan set. Uh, but but that's that's okay if you as long as you have the the technical people who have the competence and expertise in that area as long as they're signing and sealing that portion of it. Just wanted to share a quick little uh, case study with you on this. In 2014 in Washington D.C., there was a five-story residence that was built, and it was built directly on top of a Washington D.C. water uh, water and and sewer trunk line. Uh, this was a 22 foot diameter masonry sewer line it was a big trunk line that with with all this if you if you think about all the sewage in washington dc and i'm not i'm not, not just talking about our our uh, elected officials i'm talking about actual raw sewage here uh but but when you think about it 22 feet of diameter of of uh, of sewage running through here and they built this five-story building directly on top of it between the masonry pipe and the and the building was only about two feet of soil between the two and the building caused cracks in the sewer line. As you can see in the top of that pipe, it caused some cracks in there. Now, the interesting thing about it was that the entire plan set on this was stamped and signed by a vertical structural engineer. So an engineer whose, whose area of competence and expertise was in vertical structures. They didn't have a site civil do any work. They didn't, have, um, they didn't do their due diligence on what was underneath them and what was around there. And in fact, the more interesting thing was that DC water and sewer wasn't even notified about this, uh, that this building was going on until the building was complete. So they didn't go through the proper channels for approvals and things. And so DC water didn't even know that this was going to be an issue or they would have put a stop to it. And so once the building was built, they notified DC water and sewer and said, oh, by the way, there is a building right on top of your sewer line. DC water went and inspected it. They found major cracks in it and it was jeopardizing the potential of this huge trunk line. And so they had to tear down this five story building uh, and, and, and remove it. So, you know, we've got to be careful, but that's what happens when we're not, when, when we're not used to, to doing something in our area of competence, uh, they can be very, very expensive uh, fixes there. Okay, canon number three. So engineers have the obligation, the ethical obligation to issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. So that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Just don't, don't 
issue professional reports or statements or testimonies, anything to the public that is untruthful. Uh, just make sure you're being honest. So let's talk about an example of what can go wrong when public statements from a trusted source are misleading or untruthful. The Titanic. So everyone knows the story of the Titanic, um, the most beautiful and luxurious boat of her time. So it, this, this ship, during the construction of it, they've incorporated extreme safety features. They incorporated features such as 16 watertight compartments that were revolutionary compared in the boat industry at that time. And those were theoretically designed to help protect the boat from um, flooding. Now, when a, sh a magazine, a well-known magazine, the Shipbuilder magazine, called the Titanic practically unsinkable, it led the public to believe that the boat was basically indestructible. So then once that perception started going around, even the crew members and the ship operators got to a point where they, you know, they just neglected safety because they were under the impression that the Titanic was unsinkable. Um, when they did neglect safety, they didn't give out safety drills. They didn't give out safety instructions to the people boarding the ship. There wasn't enough lifeboats. It was considered to be overly crowded. Um, look, if they were to have put enough lifeboats on the boat to service everyone on the boat. So it, it, they had enough lifeboats for about half of the, um, the people on the boat. And another thing, if you've watched the movie, if you haven't watched the movie, please go watch it. I don't know what you're doing with your life if you haven't seen Titanic yet. <laughs> but in the movie, I'm serious, it's a good movie. But uh, in the movie, they neglected warnings from other ships about the icebergs in that area. In fact, they neglected six warnings and they can maintain speed and course. It took three years for them to build this boat. And it took three hours for it to sink. Over 1,500 people died. So when an organization or a trustworthy source like an engineer gives a misleading or untruthful public statement, it can create major issues. So it's super important that public statements issued by engineers are always issued in objective and truthful manners. As far as truth is concerned, the one truth that I know is there was plenty of room on that on that wood plank for Jack to get up there too. Rose was just being a, a wood plank hog. So I, just saying, plenty of room. Absolutely. Uh, Canon number four, this is uh, one that says, we will act for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. This means that we will disclose conflict of interest. It means that we're, we're not going to receive compensation for, from more than one party for any services on the same project unless it's fully disclosed. Uh, it also means that uh, engineers in public service will not participate in decisions with respect to services provided by them or their firm. Uh, so if, if that happens, if you're in public service, uh, I've, I've seen it before where, where people were uh, sitting on like planning commissions or city councils where they had a, a financial interest, they would be required to recuse themselves. That's uh, so that they don't, they don't vote on that to determine you know, something that would help their firm or themselves financially. It also includes not soliciting or contracting from a governmental body or agency where the principal or an officer of your organization or firm serves as a member of that of that governmental body. So, as I was mentioning, if you're on the planning commission or city council and and your your firm is up for a contract, then you would recuse yourself or something like that. So, uh, let's do a little another little case study here. Uh, this one I called the change order. So I'm going to lay this one out for you, and then we'll do we'll do another poll and see what you guys think. All right. So engineer A works for the the state department of transportation and is the in-house project manager on, on a project. The contractor uh, on this project submits a change order to engineer A and expects it to be approved. Now, engineer A believes that this change order is due to the contractor's faulty work. And so because it's part of their faulty work, engineer A ref refuses to sign the change order, says, absolutely not, we're not signing that. You did bad work, I'm not double paying you, I'm trying to be a good agent and steward for my agency. Right, so the contractor, because you know this never happens, where the contractor goes above engineer A's head and goes to their supervisor, who is not an engineer, mind you, and directs engineer A to sign off on the change order. Now the question is, is it ethical for engineer to engineer A to sign off on the change order? So we'll go ahead and launch that one. So I think I've launched it. Yeah, it is. Um, okay. 
Awesome. So based on Jason's uh, description, is it ethical for engineer A to sign off on that change order, even though he believes it was due to faulty work? Your answers are yes, no issues here, sign it and move on. Or yes, because the supervisor now assumes that responsibility. No, he should demand the supervisor sign it or no, he should report it to the DOT authorities. Looks like about half have voted. We'll give you just a, a few more seconds, about, about 10 more seconds, and then we'll, then we'll close this and go over the results. All right, get your votes in. Five more seconds. Three, two, one. Heather, let's go ahead and close that and click share if you would. And we'll share okay. the results. Awesome. So most of you, 73% said no, he should be reporting it to the DOT. So good. You're following canon that tells us that we need to be faithful agents to our clients. Um, a portion, 19% said no, he should demand the supervisor sign it. Um, that could be fine. And some of you said yes, the supervisor now signs, assumes responsibility, not if your signature is on there. Keep that in mind. Yeah, and and keep in mind also that if the if your supervisor is not a, a licensed or professional engineer and they're just a, a manager, you know, some someone has to has to sign and seal that. So, even though the supervisor is telling you that you should sign it, um, there's all sorts of reasons that that a supervisor might be asking you to do that. If you feel that there is an issue and you you it you don't feel comfortable signing it, then absolutely the fourth answer there, uh, assuming that and and uh, oops. Sorry, I shared it again. Um, that should be reported to the uh, DOT authorities, to the higher ups, just to let them know this is what's going on. I feel unethical about it. Now, my question is, Heather, uh, this is more a question for you. I just wanted to see what you think. Does an engineer have an obligation to save his or her client money in design? Well, I, you know, I think so. I think that it's important to come up with economical designs that are going to benefit your your client and make sure that you're saving them money. So yeah, I, I'd say yeah. Okay, I, I would agree with that. I think that's what we're looking to do is being being good stewards for our uh, for our client and our projects, and we're, we should we should have that that innovative idea of you know yeah we want to be innovative we want to come up with something that could improve this and save cost for our for our client. But I guess the next question is like at what cost? At what cost are we saving our clients money? You know I I go back to when I was doing work for developers. And I used to do a lot of work for developers, and developers were always trying to to save as much money as possible, which I, I understand. I mean, they were they were business business people, and they they wanted to to save money and maximize profit, and that's that's what you know business and capitalism is all about. Um, the the problem is when when an engineer is is pressured into choosing something that they know is maybe we'll save their client the developer money up front but could be a problem for the for the general public or the taxpayers in the future let's say there's a product that's going to last 100 years versus a product that we know may only last under these certain conditions and situations 15 or 20 years now both products may be acceptable per the standards and specs and we might be able to say yeah you can use this and we can use it but if we know in that area because of the 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 soils and the the, the different things, the bed load and things that may happen and may may uh, cause problems with these with one of the products and make it not last as long as it could. Is it is it ethical to try to save our client money up front, knowing that it will cost money to the taxpayers in the future because instead of lasting a hundred years or so, they may have to replace it in ten or fifteen or twenty or twenty five years. So that's something we need to keep in mind as engineers to make sure that we're maintaining that that. Uh, Honest and integrity, or honesty and integrity, that the that the public has uh, for our for our profession. We want to make sure that we keep that. So don't just remember, or don't just think about how much money this is going to save our client today. Is it going to cost other people that uh, money in the future? So just something to think about. Good points, Jason. Okay, so canon number five is to build professional reputation on merit of the services and, and, and you should not compete unfairly with others. So what this means is basically you're building your reputation on um, your qualifications. You're not falsifying your qualifications. You're not misrepresenting you or your associates or your firm's um, qualifications. Uh, that includes in your brochures or in your presentations. 
you don't offer or give or solicit, receive directly or indirectly any contributions to influence the word of a contract. Now, here comes up a really interesting and, and kind of, oh man, this is a little bit outrageous, but this is an example of how this ethics code was abused. Um, in a story of Vice President Spiro Agnew in the administ and Nixon administration. So Jason, there's a video here. If you can pull that video up, um, that'll kind of start off the discussion a little bit. Absolutely. Let me get this here. Okay. It's coming up right now and I will play it here. Okay, so if you can go back to the presentation. Okay, so let's talk about that. What was going on here? So this is absolutely a direct, um, a direct neglect of our ethics as engineers, right? So they were bribe, bribing public officials in order to get more work. Um, that is falsifying qualifications, that's, that's bribery, um, and that's creating unfair competition for other engineering firms. So what happened to the people involved? So Agnew became vice president and in 1969, he ended up resigning in 1973 because of this scandal. And what did he get charged for? He didn't get charged for taking a bribe. Apparently back then, or maybe even currently, I don't know, um, it wasn't unethical to take a bribe as a public official. Now, he got charged for tax evasion. He didn't report that in his taxes. So what happened to the engineers? Well, um, every engineer that was caught red-handed in that act lost their license, lost the ability to practice engineering, and they were forced to lose ownership in the interests of their firm. So huge, huge consequences for, for make, creating unfair competition for bribing a public official. Um, so this is a pretty cool story about why it's so important to base your reputation off your services and qualifications, not through unfair methods like bribery or bribing a vice president. That's a big deal. <laughs> I would expect nothing less than from the uh, Nixon administration. So speaking of <laughs> reputation, uh, you know, the, the sixth canon is to conduct, conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. Uh, Canon 6 of the ASCE code states, engineers shall act in a manner as to uphold and enhance the honor, integrity, and dignity of the engineering profession, and shall act with zero tolerance for bribery, fraud, and corruption. Now, I would be remiss if I, if I saw the word reputation on the page there, and I didn't pay, pay homage to the greatest album of all time, um, you know, Taylor Swift's reputation album. Um, it's amazing. That's the greatest album of all time. So way to go Taylor Swift on making something that is absolutely <laughs> perfect. I want to thank that. And one of my favorite things is when fans of, of artists try to recreate their, uh, their album art and album covers. And again, being the, uh, the, the T-Swift fan that I am, I would be remiss if I didn't share with you my picture of me uh, recreating this Reputation album cover, uh, I think personally, oh. it's pretty amazing. So, Jason, 
want to say uh, it's it's yeah. Oh, it's hard to tell which is which. I know I'm the one on the right. Okay, uh, let's do a quick case study based on this canon here. And and Heather, I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to quiz you on this one. I'm going to lay it out for you and I'm going to see what you think. All right, so here we go. Uh, engineering firm they they decide to fund one of their employees to establish a DBE company uh, under under this employee's name to bid as a sub subcontractor on state projects. So uh, the the DBE would be the uh, disenfranchised business entity, right? So so a, a minority owned company, and mm -hmm. so the engineering firm then decides they work out a deal where they say we'll we'll do the work, but we'll pay you as the DBE a fixed fee to help us get this get this project because there's a, a we 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 score higher and rank higher if we are a DBE. Now, Heather, is this ethical under the code of ethics? I would have to say not. No, I don't think so. Absolutely right. This action is not ethical and it definitely violates Canon 6. Okay. Okay. And we've made it to Canon 7. So continuing professional development, which is what all of you are doing right now, if you're being attentive. We can see if you're not being attentive, by the way. I didn't know you could. I thought that's really cool. Um, what does this one mean to us? So basically all this means is it wants us to ensure that we're continuing our learning and we're updating our knowledge. Just like ethics, design practices may change over time and it's important to keep your knowledge of the newest updates, right? So this is not only about you, it's also about encouraging your other employees. So if you're working with eight other engineers and, and, you work, and seven of them are, are working underneath you as an EIT, work on getting them knowledge too, right? That's important as well. So let's take a look at the national requirements um, on professional development and what are those requirements and how do they relate to ethics? So in Utah, professional engineers are required to get 30 professional development hours every two years. So that's 15 a year. Each one is an hour. You're getting one from this webinar. If you go to a um, conference, typically you can get them all in one conference, right? So you can knock them all out at one time. Um, or if it's 2020 and everything's locked down and all the cancel conferences got canceled, just attend Mount States webinars. We've done what, Jason? How many have you done this last couple months? Uh, this is our 11th. Hey, you almost got them. If you've attended all of these, you almost have 15 credits for this year. So the only thing in Utah is they don't, we don't require ethics courses. That's not a, that's not a requirement, but you guys are going above and beyond and here you are getting an ethics course. So great job again. Uh, other states do, there's actually 16 other states that require um, ethics PDHs. So New Mexico is the only one in the West and Nevada actually requires an ethics exam. And I believe Canada requires an ethics exam if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. but that's, that's your continuing ed education when it relates to ethics. Perfect. So as Heather mentioned earlier, the uh, there is a new canon, an eighth canon that was added in July uh, 2017, and it says that engineers shall in all manners related to their profession treat all persons fairly and encourage equitable participation. Uh, this includes without regard to gender, gender identity, race, national origin, ethnicity, religion, uh, age, sexual orientation, disability, political affiliation, especially political affiliation, uh, you know, for those of us that uh, are, are stupid enough to, to register as Democrats, uh, please don't don't uh, discriminate against us. We have it hard enough as it is. Um, family, marital, economic status, those things, right? So, so this is a, a great canon that, that hope, hopefully will help us all uh, treat people fairly. We've got about 10 minutes left, which is great because we've got about 10 minutes worth of, of uh, information uh, remaining here. So I'm going to do another case study and we're going to launch this poll. I'll lay it out real quickly. So Engineer A is an employee of Firm X. All right. Engineer A maintains copies of everything that he signed and sealed for his own personal records. Okay, for his own personal and professional liability, just to make sure that he he's uh, covering his bases. All right. So he leaves the firm, and the firm demands that that he return the copies, claiming that they're the property of the firm. Engineer A refuses, saying, "No, I have a right to these. These are my work. I signed them. I sealed them. They're my work." So the question is, was it ethical? Uh, to re for engineer A to refuse to return the copy. So my question is, who owns the work? I just launched that poll. So who owns the work? Let's go ahead and vote on that. Okay. So Jason says, does it? it the engineer did the work, right? The engineering firm hired him to do the work. The client hired them to do the work. So who owns it? Is it the engineer? Is it the engineering firm? Is it the client? 
or is it nobody? It belongs to all of us collectively, dude. You can tell that statement was written by a Democrat. Darn right it was. <laughs> all right, we'll give you about 10 more seconds of voting here. Uh, about two thirds of you have voted, so we'll we'll give you a few more seconds here. All righty. So we'll close and share that. So if Heather, if you wanna go over those results. Yeah, so who owns the work? So 7% of you said the engineer, 37% um, said the engineering firm, and 50% said the client. Well, I would agree with the 50% that said the client, um, but it is one of those gray areas, right? Who ends up paying for that work, I believe, owns it in the end. Uh, but if, Jason, what if they would have discussed some sort of negotiation or agreement upon him leaving the, the company or her yeah. leaving the company, great, right? Great, great point. So the... That's a that's a good a good question there. So um, a lot of times that is laid out in contracts, and that's why we have either employment contracts or contracts with clients on who owns the work, who gets it at, at some point. So if you said the engineering firm or the client, if you said either of those, then I would say that those are the two correct answers there on there. Either of those would, would be correct because typically you would have a contract with a client that says, yes, um, we own the work, we have the right to that work. Uh, and so that's that's pretty typical there. But at the very least, the engineering firm has would would uh, negotiate something there at the uh, discuss and negotiate the terms of that engineer's departure to make sure that you know he he does have a legitimate interest in in the work that he sealed. But Firmex also has that proprietary and and those proprietary rights to that work because they hired that engineer to do that work for them. They paid them to do that work for them as a whole. So that's that's a great, great point. Those are things that we need to be thinking of and be careful of and make sure they're spelled out clearly. Uh, those are the problems or things that you uh, you typically don't see until it's almost too late. So uh, great, great poll. Thank you all for, for sharing those there. So let's transition now to the liability side. We talked about ethics. We talked about the industry code. So these are some definitions that are critical for you to understand. Duty, standard of care, negligence, and liability. I'm going to go into each of those here. Okay. So duty is a legal obligation that entails mandatory conduct or performance uh, to render services or perform certain acts. So this is what is what is legally required for your profession to do, all right? And so it, it has a guidelines and, and standards of what you need to do. Now, standard of care is a little bit different, okay? Standard of care means that you would perform as others would reasonably do in those same circumstances. So duty is typically you know, the engineering duty is typically defined in, in standards or canons or, or codes of conduct and, um, you know, your specifications, your standards on how things are going to be done, what, how a project needs to be designed or built. These are your design guidelines and, and those things. Now, standard of care is, is a little bit more uh, subjective and open to interpretation. It, it looks at what would other people do in that same situation? What would, would, would typically be done and what's the accepted standard of practice and standard of care? Now, negligence is a failure to do what is reasonably required so that means you are you are violating and going against the duty and it can also be be interpreted as you've gone against that standard of care but it, it's especially negligence is especially related to duty where if it's outlined and shown what you what your duty is and what you have to do as an engineer and you violate that that would be considered negligence now liability and that's what uh what Heather's going to talk about here in a moment with a case study is this is the condition of being responsible for a possible or actual loss or a penalty or an expense or a burden. So we understand that in our job, we take risks. That's, you know, everything involves risk. Everything in our life, every everything involves a certain level of risk. And so we as engineers are, are look to, to, to ensure that we are balancing that out and we are taking a, 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 a calculated risk in things. Right. And so but in doing so, there is some level of liability that we need to take on. So it's important that we educate ourselves on on this, the, the duties, the standard of practice, the, the specifications, the, the design standards and all of those things. Because if we don't, if we don't uh, educate ourselves on the, all those things and we just willy nilly go out and spec things and don't back it up, we we take liability upon ourselves similar to what we uh what we saw happen in Texas. And Heather, I'll turn the time over to you to share about the uh, the fish hatchery in Texas. Awesome, thank you. So since we're almost, we're running out of time here, I'm gonna go kind of go quickly through this project. So this is a fish hatchery project out in Texas. It was a project valued at $27 million. It's a big job. You can't maybe tell that from the scale of just the drawing. 
Uh, the project construction started in 2008. Let's just think about the design scenarios you're going to have to consider for this type of project. You're likely going to have groundwater. The soil properties are probably not going to be ideal. It's, you know, we're working with a lot of water, a lot of um, um, saturated soils. And so you really want to spend some time thinking about the underground infrastructure. So this project had a lot of pipe, um, 11,000 feet of pipe to be exact. It had 30 inch, 48 inch, and 60 inch diameter and all of that pipe that was installed was in HDPE. So underground infrastructure can often get overlooked. So let's find out what happened with this project. Um, you probably can already guess that something went wrong, otherwise it wouldn't be in the liability section of this, of this presentation. So about 30% of this project was completed and then they started noticing pipe failures. Okay. So a forensic investigation was ordered and they started finding excessive pipe deflection. So they started checking this out. Things were going real wrong. So what went wrong? Let's talk about design first. So in the design side, they in that forensic investigation, they found that the engineer used fill height tables. And that's fine and dandy, but when you use fill height tables, you need to think about the assumptions and the parameters that those fill height tables were designed off of, right? Likely they did not consider groundwater. Um, there's probably assumptions of soil density and different materials that are used in the compaction. So if you're using those, so it, those fill height tables, you need to make sure that those fill height tables, the, the design assumptions and, and parameters directly match what you're designing that pipe for. And then geotechnical studies. So, Geotechnical portion of, of a project, when you think about overall project budget, if there's so small amounts of money, and it can be so critical to the success of the project. And in this project, um, site-specific soil properties were not really taken into consideration. In fact, there were geotechnical studies that were done, and the engineering firm did not utilize those geotechnical studies and groundwater. So in terms of groundwater, it's not uncommon with, with underground infrastructure to have groundwater present, especially on a fish, fish hatchery. Okay, so there's a lot of water present already. Groundwater impacts the underground infrastructure. You're going to have additional forces like buoyancy or water weight that you're going to have to look into. And then last one, this one's underlined here because this is something that we see quite common. Um, Installation specs, they're basically what we're giving in the plan set to tell the contractor how to install this product, right? So what steps or specs need to be followed? So different pipe materials are going to require different installation specifications. RCP being a rigid pipe that is structurally designed to meet the loads of the project. Um, that one has going to have lesser design and installation requirements than perhaps a flexible pipe because the flexible pipe is designed to have to, to be more of a conduit where the installation around that conduit needs to be properly compacted. It needs to act as a structure to support the loading of the project. So we talked about the issues that occurred in the design phase of this project, but what about installation? And Heather, I so do want to point out, I do want to point oh, yeah. out as well that in the design, initially the project was going to be concrete, but the contractor thought that he could save some money by switching over to flexible pipe and the engineer never updated the design to to uh, modify those installation specifications to for that flexible you mentioned the difference between a, the conduit and the structure uh, initially they were planning on using concrete pipe and, and the the plans were designed for that but they were never updated for the additional structural capacity and, and need to build that structure in the field so that's another interesting point on this project as well so keep yeah it. really good point jason so in terms of installation, what happened, what went wrong? So compaction, it wasn't compacted properly. They probably didn't use the right materials in, in the installation process. You needed to have different soils for um, different, different pipe installations. The trench box, so as you can see in this picture, the trench box in the forensic in, in, uh, investigation, it wasn't wide enough for them to properly compact in, in the side, the haunches of the pipe um and they slid it along as they were installing and so what that means is as they were installing that pipe they are moving a structure out of that trench so what happens that soil that wasn't that void it gets filled by the soil so it ends up reducing your compaction and then groundwater it wasn't dewatered um groundwater wasn't taken into consideration and communication so this is a huge one on our project so there's a proper form of communication avenue right so communication is a key part of every project and utilizing your rfis 
in order to make sure that you're discussing things, concerns before the project gets too far down the road. That can greatly reduce chances for errors. Exactly. So we are going to launch one more poll here. I just launched it. Who is responsible for the $3.3 million fix? Is it the manufacturer, the design engineer, the contractor, or the public agency? Who's going to have to uh, pay for this, do you think? Okay, about half of you have voted. We'll keep this open for another about 10 seconds so we can get all the votes in. All right, we will close that and share it. And it, uh, yeah, it looks like about 44% of you said design engineer, 48%. So roughly about half said it was either design engineer or the contractor. Uh, that's very good. Uh, Matt Williams with the Outdoor News stated, um, who's going to foot the bill? He brought this up in 2009. He said both the construction company that installed the pipe and the engineering company that designed the project are saying they did everything right, but it is real obvious something went wrong here. It could be that multiple parties have some culpability here. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, um, what happened was it turns out the design firm, the design engineering firm that didn't update the specs and didn't have the correct installation specs in there, uh, ended up bearing the brunt of the repair bill of that $3.3 million. The contract. And when you say the brunt, it was $3.2 million out of the $3.3 million that the design firm had to pay. Yes. So, so, so the contractor deal. ended up paying about $100,000. Yeah. Good point. You know, as Heather mentioned before, with the, uh, you know, because it was designed as concrete pipe, that they're building a structure. The engineer, you know, calls out manufactured per ASTM C76. The manufacturer says, okay, we'll do it. The installer installs it per that specification. What happened in flexible pipe is the engineer just said per manufacturer's recommendations rather than um, checking what those were. The manufacturer re re refers to the spec ASTM D2321 in which the engineer is referenced 29 times and what their responsibility is, which then goes back to the engineer. And so this case, uh, when it was determined who had the uh, ownership and liability on it, this was determined that the engineer did because uh, the manufacturer's recommendations refer to this spec that say what the engineer's responsibility is in in calling out installation specs and, and standards and, and how to install it, uh, doing the due diligence on the, as Heather mentioned, with the geotech and the compaction and all of that. So there were a lot of things left out there. Awesome. Okay, so takeaways of today's webinar. So we came to the end. We talked about three main things. We talked about ethics first. We then discuss different industry codes that you can utilize to understand what your obligations are as, an, as a professional engineer. And we also talked about liability. So we really hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and learned a little bit more about your obligations and responsibilities and as they relate to ethics in the engineering profession. And at this time, uh, we'd like to open it up to questions. Jason, I don't know if it's going through or not, but Sorry, there it, we go. Yeah, it, it, Kind of froze on me for a second there. All right. So questions. We did have a couple of questions, and I apologize. We got going so fast there that we did. I didn't see some of these comments. Um, some people said that they they couldn't hear the audio of the video. When I send out um, another question was, uh, oh, darn. will you be sending out PDA certificates? I will be sending out PDA certificates either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. When I do that, I will also send out a link to that video um, if you want to watch the Spiro Agnew video. Um, it's a little bit long. We only clipped out about a minute of it um, so that it would kind of set the story for Spiro Agnew. But um, it's actually like a, I think it was like a 14 minute long video. Uh, but but I'll, I'll go ahead and just attach a link for those of you that couldn't hear it. And we'll make sure that you can, uh, you can get that so that you can you can watch that video in its entirety. I'll go back through it because we did show the audio clip at the very beginning. Was it that video um, on the Minnesota bridge collapse, or was it the audio on the ethics of vice president? Um, they said they couldn't hear the video. Is what the comment. Okay. Was. So, that's, that's um, so that was the only question. Was um, oh, we've got another one here. Uh, Let's see here. Would you send out the recording of this so I could share it with my coworkers? Absolutely, I would love to. I'll also, um, I'll get that, uh, Brittany asked that question. Brittany, I will be uploading it to uh, YouTube tonight and then um, it takes a, it takes about 30 minutes to get it get it downloaded and then uploaded back to, to a YouTube. So by this afternoon, I'll have that uploaded to our YouTube channel. I will then send that link out as well. 
So I will definitely do that for you. Okay, um, let's see here. Yeah, looks like that's all the, the questions we have. We'll, we'll stay on here for another uh, minute or two in case anybody else had questions. But we do appreciate you guys all, um, you know, jumping on this call with us today in this webinar and allowing us to share uh, some ideas and some case studies and things with, with ethics and the fundamental canons. Hopefully you all had a chance to uh, download the handout and that, that had the uh, NSPE uh, engineering creed. So uh, it looks like that's about it, Heather. Heather, I, I want to thank you again. I appreciate you. Uh, you know, thanks for having me. That was a really good time to present with you on ethics. Um, what about the next webinar? When are you going to host another webinar and what's the topic? Have you thought you know, about it yet? That is a fantastic question. We mentioned that we'd be doing these about once a month um, moving forward after we finished up uh, early June. Uh, with our with our 10 present and, and also I, I would point out that for those of you that are still on if you ever want to go back and watch any of those 10 that we did um some are technical some are more about presenting or uh, more non-technical things but we have all of those available on our youtube channel as well so uh if you want to just search mountain states concrete pipe association on youtube it'll bring up our youtube channel we have 10 other webinars that we've done uh, this one will be added to that tonight uh, you can watch those at any time uh, you want and and uh, we were, this was our first one back after doing those 10. We were doing them every Friday. We decided to do this one today. Um, we do have one planned, I believe, Heather, you have one about uh, innovations in the uh, concrete pipe industry in August. Uh, so I was yeah, thinking we yes, would just invite everybody to, to watch you give that presentation. Do you know what date, uh, date and time that is yet? Yeah, I think. Let me double check. I believe it's like the second Thursday in August. Let me quick check okay. real quick. Perfect. Um, we may see how that goes. We may just utilize that as our uh, as our August one, unless there's an unless someone reaches out with another topic they'd like us to do. But I think that would be an interesting one to invite all of these uh, fine folks to. Yeah. So it's going to be on the twentieth. It's um, the third Thursday in August, I believe. So okay. we'll send out that information. That should be a really fun one. It's going to be a nationwide one, right? So there's going to be a lot more people, not just Utah. Exactly. So perfect. We'll uh, we'll we'll send we'll keep you all posted on what's what's going on there and and any other announcements of things that we have coming up uh, you know regarding some of our other events for the later in the year. But uh, everybody, please stay safe. Uh, thank you for joining us and and stay healthy. We uh, we look forward to to hearing from you all next time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.